In this episode of Detroit Performs, a family-owned dairy creates tasty treats, a family runs a farm on the east side of Detroit, and the art of good cooking and business come together. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and today we're at Guernsey Farms Dairy in Northville, Michigan. Because let's get real, food is so good, it just has to be art. Our first Food is Art segment highlights the main event here, their ice cream. Each year, families flock to Guernsey to get a taste of this frozen dessert and eat it on this giant rock. Let's take a look at how this tasty treat is created. There's an art to the perfect scoop. I think just about everybody in our family was uh, trained extensively by my grandfather to, to scoop that perfect one. scoop and uh, it's uh, make it look big and, and uh, keep the customer happy. People are looking for a comfort food and you know entertainment you know to bring the families out and what, what better thing product is, is than ice cream. The ice cream is important to Guernsey because it's a staple. I mean it's what people look for. It's been around for 75 years. It's what people put on their table at the end of the night when they're done with dinner, and it's, it's, it's important to us. It's important for our customers. My father, John McGuire, established the company back in 1940. He started in uh, downtown Northville. He bought it from uh, two gentlemen, Livingston and Applehoff, and it was called the Red Rose Dairy. And he changed the name to Guernsey Dairy because back then everybody knew what a Guernsey was. Guernsey is a cow. Our last name is not Guernsey. <laughs> the ice cream base is the, the formula that my dad created when he went to Michigan Agriculture College. That's uh, it's a 14% mix that uh, he created back then. And then the different flavors come from different flavor houses that come to us, uh, like the Northville Lab right here in Northville. And we take their, their products and we blend them and they come up with ideas and they give us ideas. Making ice cream is an art form in the respect that um, you take different flavors that you wouldn't expect to be in ice cream. You've got to find the balance of each flavor to, to blend with the ice cream mix. You start with that mix, you blend those flavors, and then you start adding candies and variegates and different things to it. The art form, it, it starts there and it finishes at the end of the process, and that's making sure that the ice cream that's coming out of the freezer is exactly the way you want it. So when you start making ice cream, you basically start with a basic mix. We have two or three mixes that we work with. We have a basic white mix, a chocolate, and a double dark chocolate. From that point, once you've, you've blended all the products and all the things that you need to make your mix, we pasteurize that mix and then we age that mix. Once the mix has been aged, we come in the next morning and we'll have a run set up of what flavors we're gonna run on that particular day. That basic mix will get pumped into flavoring tanks. Those flavoring tanks get the flavor that's added to make that particular flavor. From there, we're gonna pump it through what we call a barrel freezer. That barrel freezer will bring the core temperature of the product down to roughly 21 and a half degrees. And then from there, we can start adding inclusions, variegates, and things like that. And it comes out into your basic 48 ounce package that you see in retail or the three gallon tubs that we sell to our uh, dipping stores. The person in charge of making the ice cream has to have a very good taster because it's you know it's kind of an art. You gotta you gotta know the taste of so that the, the batches are the same. You work with it, you know, you gotta get the the right amount of condiments into the ice cream so it's it's the same every time. You, you need to get those swirls, you know, the caramels and the fudges. You want it to look good when it's in the, the dipping store, so it's 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 an art. Once the ice cream has been blended and we've packaged it, we take that ice cream to a blast freezer. That blast freezer is at a negative 22 below zero with a wind chill of about 40 below. So within eight hours, we've taken that 21 and a half degree product and put it down to less than 10 degrees. And within 12 hours, we should be at about 20 below zero. It's 
Sanders came to us. They took their company and improved, and they came to us because they wanted a, a quality product. From there, it kind of blossomed into a really good relationship, and you know, we do a lot of different things with them now, and it's, a, it's been a great partnership. Having two Detroit local companies together, I mean, you, you can't ask for anything better. That's what's been great about this state and what's uh, really kind of laid the foundation for the companies that have been able to make it through the, the recession and the, and the hard times. That, and, and it's great to, to work with, with local companies and, and Michigan made. I mean, we, we want people to know that, you know, we're, we're a force to be reckoned with. Our number one flavor is Butter Cat, which was my dad's favorite ice cream. All the ice cream is made from his basic ice cream formula, but we, we take different ice creams and we work on them to, to perfect them. And Butter Pecan was his favorite, so we worked on that and perfected it back in the, in the 70s. Batching new flavors um, really requires us coming up with the flavor profile. Some of it's the recipes that my grandpa had passed on for years. When I was making ice cream, there was different times that you'd be walking along and you'd say, hey, I can make that, I can make that, I can put it into an ice cream. And other times it was sitting down and trying to pick different things and put them together and come up with a different flavor profile. The cream de novi, definitely, you know, we, we did that uh, several years ago as a kind of a tribute to novi. Um, throughout the years we've done different things. The newest one was the Midnight Train to Travers. You know, when my grandpa turned 100, you know, that was a, was a big flavor, Grandpa's Blueberry Way. And that was a, a, a key thing to us and, you know, we wanted to really pay tribute to him and what he's done for this company and, and for us. Keeping the family in the Guernsey business is, is important because that's kind of the foundation of what my grandfather built. Everything we do is, is based on family and the quality and perfection that, that we all know. And, you know, we want to pass that on not only to different generations in our family, but uh, to the surrounding community and, and people around us. You know, we want people to know what we're about. From back in the 70s until the 2000s, it was myself, and before that it was my brother or my dad, and then now it's uh, my sons are involved in it. We take uh, pride, and all of our employees take pride in being part of the, the family. Other creations created at Guernsey, um, we obviously have our world famous chocolate milk, which was really developed by my grandma and grandpa that uh, spent a lot of time coming up with that. Different products that are, that are unique to us, we, you know, we, we believe that we've got probably the best milk in the state. We have uh, a, a great restaurant where we uh, serve an excellent uh, roasted chicken, and then with the meals you get a, a sample of our ice cream if you've never tasted it. So that's uh, a great treat. We have a lot of other new menu items. Chef Jim, who uh, does an excellent job, and he makes some of the, the best soups that I've ever tasted. And we have our convenience store where you can get some milk and ice cream and a lot of specialty items. And we have our gift baskets and our hot fudge butterscotch and chocolate syrup that when my dad turned 80, he was looking for something to do, so he, he developed all those uh, products. We'd love to see kids have their big smiles on their face and eating their ice cream and sitting out on the rocks. And if you go around the, the United States, you'll, you'll run into somebody that sat on the Guernsey rocks and remembers eating their, our ice cream. It's funny, we, we were actually here this past Sunday. We stopped in and I was, I was sitting in the car and I looked out and I, I saw a little kid sitting on the rock eating some ice cream. And it's gratifying, it's probably the most incredible feeling to see someone who's probably doesn't even know who we are that come here on a regular basis that to enjoy something with their family and what we enjoy on a regular basis you know there wasn't a day that went by in our family that we didn't sit down after dinner and we had ice cream I mean it, they're literally every day and to see those those families and those kids and those people and adults coming in it, it's it's remarkable to see after 75 years that tradition still stands very strong in this community. Mm. This Guernsey ice cream is delicious. Our next segment takes us to Detroit, where Rising Pheasant Farms is taking on Urban Gardening. Rising Pheasant Farms is a family-owned, small-scale farm here on the east side of Detroit. We started in 2009, and we deliver all our shoots and heirloom veggies by Bicycle Power. 
I mean, I love growing in Detroit. You know, everything in life has pluses and minuses. Um, certainly growing in a city, uh, growing in Detroit in particular, uh, has those pluses and minuses. I feel like the pluses are, are the community. I've never met more amazing people than I have uh, in the city of Detroit. So I think that was a big, a big part of why we wanted to grow here is because I just fell in love with it. We had many discussions about what we wanted to do as far as growing food, but, but I think that just bringing together our backgrounds and, and areas of knowledge, I think that we, you know, just kind of like figured the project out in bits, you know, and then eventually kind of put the puzzle together. But it's not a very complicated puzzle. We're not doing anything out of the ordinary like, like other farmers don't do, you know. We uh, grow stuff every week. We put it on a vehicle and take it down to the market and sell it. I mean, the Easter Market is, is an amazing resource, you know, one of the last working food districts in the United States. Um, but a, a concentration of food businesses uh, around a municipal market, that was the old model, you know. The Easter Market is going to celebrate its 125th anniversary year after next. And uh, it really uh, has remained intact since the horse and buggy days. So we like to think of ourselves as like a return to the, you know, the old days when people would get to Easter Market by bicycle back in the gay 90s. And the other huge part is, you know, we're bicycle based, so you know that's not really a very practical option, you know, if we're a two hour drive from all our markets because we're in the middle of nowhere uh, in the country. But it's a very practical and cost efficient and everything um, choice when you're in an urban setting. Generally on the east side, we're, we're becoming fairly well known. People say hi to us. You know, if I don't have the boys with me, they ask where the boys are. We, we probably get more tourist attention when we go through midtown and downtown. But a lot of that is just because of the, the, what the setup looks like. We have a fancy bike from the Netherlands with the box in front. And then we have the trailer behind, which is sometimes stacked quite high. So I think all those things contribute to a bike that looks very out of the ordinary. And it has young kids in the front with helmets on and they, you know, it's like a cute vehicle. Uh, it, it spreads joy. It's an endless journey outside yourself. You build your entire life. It really makes a lot of economical sense for our business. And then obviously you've got the, um, long-term sustainability aspect that you know is very important to us you know we definitely work in the context of peak oil and the fact that you know these the whole system is is based on cheap oil and that that is going to be forever available and in the same supply and you know uh, the reality I think is that that's just not true and we felt like for our our own livelihood and for the business, for long-term sustainability, we didn't want to be based on that same assumption. So, um, so that's a really important part of our farm. And like I said, only really doable here um, because you got the land, but you're also in a city. We like to think that what we're doing is very grounded in, you know, very typical farming practices. And uh, I think that it's easier for us to do it without the use of chemicals or synthetic fertilizer because of the scale that we're doing it on. And I think that helps us at market. We're able to, you know, tell folks that our produce is naturally grown. We don't spray anything. We use stuff like row cover to, to ward off pests instead of, you know, spraying pesticide. But I feel like, you know, we're just trying to be really good stewards of our little corner of Detroit and be good neighbors. We have to keep their interests in mind, but uh, we like to reach out to folks in the neighborhood and I think that, uh, yeah, we, we think we've got something set up here that, that would be hard to set up somewhere else. Well, we're really excited about the, the future of the farm and all the possibilities. We've recently purchased new land, so we're looking to expand our field production. Uh, we're getting our greenhouse hooked up with uh, heat, so we're hoping to be year-round with our shoots. Long-term, who knows? Uh, Detroit's definitely in a place of of ever-changing transition, but we definitely hope that our children are interested in being a big part of the farm and maybe taking over it once we're, we're old and gray. 
But it's a very exciting time to be in Detroit and, and be involved in the urban agriculture movement here. And we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> While I get some more ice cream, you can learn more about Rising Pheasant Farms and all the artists you saw here today on DetroitPerforms.org. Now, let's check out some upcoming events happening in and around the D. To discover more events in Greater Detroit, visit ICSITY.com. Do you ever wonder how people are able to make the edible creations they come up with and put on store shelves? Well, unlike Guernsey, some people with ideas don't have the kitchen or knowledge to get their product out. For those breaking into the culinary world, the business side can be a stumbling block. So we visit a food business incubator where cooks get a dose of business acumen. The kitchen started about a year and a half ago, uh, and really, uh, we realized that there was a gap in the Cleveland uh, community where uh, people just needed some place to go where they wanted to start their businesses. Somebody will come to us and they'll say that they have uh, a pasta sauce that's been in the family for generations, and they want to go out and start marketing that to places like Heinen's and Giant Eagle and Constantino's. Uh, we'll sit down with them and tell them about the whole process, uh, what's needed, everything from FDA specifications, uh, what needs to go on the label, uh, all the way to making sure that the product uh, is stable. Um, you don't want to have a product that's going to be sitting on the grocery store shelf and blowing up six months later. So uh, we'll help them with all of that, uh, pretty much from concept uh, all the way to creation. Uh, from the time that they walk into the door till two months later when they have product in hand ready to sell. Our company, Saucy Son, is um, an artisan meat company. The name of my product is Holmes Mouthwater and Applesauce. My company is Red Lotus Foods. The Pope's Kitchen is our brand and our bottled about 16 products we're making right now. Clark, Jean, Ethan, and Melissa came to the Culinary Launch Kitchen with different levels of knowledge about the food industry and different food products in various stages of development. What the kitchen really provided at the time I came in is a background and understanding that for the types of food that I create, I need an, an official candy license. There's so much, uh, so much to take on. Anyone who's ever started a business knows that. And, uh, and I needed that support. Some of these uh, amazing people can start out of their home and get their home approved to do their jams and things like that. Unfortunately, I can't. I needed a professional um, commercial kitchen to do it in. So um, that was the biggest step for us. When somebody says, okay, I've got a product, it tastes great. I know I want to sell it, but I don't know what I need to do in order to get it on the shelves at Heinen's. That's where we'll really step in and uh, assist them with making sure that they cover all the bases to make sure that um, everything is going to be shelf stable and is going to be safe for consumption. Uh, that's the biggest void. People also do have a hard time uh, with figuring out where uh, all the margins are. Obviously, they want to make a good product. They want to make uh, this, uh, you know, their living, but they want to make sure that they're charging the right amount for a product. Uh, we'll suggest uh, different margins that they should uh, anticipate in the marketplace, both with what they should make as well as what distributors and uh, what retailers are normally asking for. To assist entrepreneurs with getting their recipes ready for market, the Cleveland Culinary Launch Kitchen serves up a course about the food business where chefs learn everything from pricing to packaging. We do offer an eight-week class uh, that covers everything from financials, uh, we'll work on business plans with them, and then at the end of eight weeks, as long as uh, we're happy with uh, how everything uh, worked out with the class, uh, then we'll invite them to become members of the kitchen. Uh, at that point, the uh, help really never ends. Uh, we'll assist them with making sure that they scale their products up correctly so that if they're making 
10 bottles of barbecue sauce and want to make 1,000, we can assist with making sure that they do all the calculations uh, correctly. Uh, the kitchen um, has basically showed me that things are possible um, and they've also showed me the steps to create um, and you know to get to those uh, like Heinen's and all those markets that I've you know recently acquired. Um, they've also showed me a lot of knowledge um, just you know taught me a lot about you know health standards you know I also did a class uh, you know with the state of Ohio on basically just you know being in the kitchen the proper uh, ways washing your hands and just managing everything. And so all of those steps have led me to where I am today. Since the Culinary Launch Kitchen opened, they've been involved in bringing dozens of new products to market. To meet the demands of so many different products, CCLK is equipped with a fully licensed commercial kitchen. Uh, we have the kitchen divided up into several different stations. All sorts of commercialized equipment that you would find uh, in a restaurant and not so much uh, at home. Well, it's ex extremely important to have a kitchen that is fully licensed uh, and that is available 24 hours a day. I have the flexibility to use it whenever, whenever I'm available. Automatically on day one, you step into the kitchen and take it from a hobby to a real business so that I am presenting myself to the public as a real business. You're safe. I'm insured. We're covered because to be a part of the kitchen, you have to have the right insurances. For all of the support that the Cleveland Culinary Launch Kitchen offers budding entrepreneurs through seminars, training, and shared space, perhaps the most important resource of all is the relationships and connections that the Launch Kitchen users forge between themselves. The networking that I got as a result of being at the kitchen, um, the support from other new business owners, at some point in time, you're going to find yourself at a situation that another tenant's already been in. And so, you know, everybody becomes, uh, we become friends. And, you know, you come in and you're like, oh, man, I'm dealing with the health department. I don't know what they want. And they're like, oh, my gosh, I just went through this. And so, you know, everyone's really willing to give advice and kind of help you through and coach you. You know, it's the rising tide rises all ships motif. And so you've got that asset. I could have eventually gotten licensed in my own kitchen and figured that stuff out. The advantage is I didn't have to figure that out. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on coming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank Guernsey Farms for allowing us to tour their facility, shop, and eat at their restaurant. In fact, I'm going to have a nice meal right now. So, until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I am DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.